Okie doke. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna, as as per usual, start out with some of the news, and then I know Bill um, Bill Swan has something that he wants to show, uh, and then anybody else who has anything. And then I thought I'd talk about um, N phase AC coupled systems. We talked a bit about N phase. N phase is now more than half the the installed um, systems for for residential. And a lot of folks are asking about battery options with, with these microinverters. So thought I'd talk about the components, how that all works. So anyway, um, in the news, when I researched it this week, I found uh, Pennsylvania is starting to hold some hearings about making, um, they, the article said community solar making it legal, but I think really what they're talking about is making it not so much mandatory, but mandatory for utilities to comply with, with um, billing options for community solar. So it looks like PA is gonna be, um, Pennsylvania is gonna be doing some um, uh, community solar and they're touting it as a, as a benefit to farmers. So I thought that was an interesting, seems to be very bipartisan. So that's, that's good. I'm, I'm beginning to get a sense anyway in a lot of these legislators, legislatures that the Republican Democrat divide is beginning to disappear when it comes to solar. I think the money is talking on both sides of the aisle. So hopefully we're, we're seeing some of that disappear. Um, also the report just came out that for the first half of 2021, solar and wind combined uh, account for 91.6% of all of the new energy um, generating capacity installed in America. So almost 92% is coming from wind and solar. The other 8% would be natural gas. So it really is just continuing the battle between wind, solar, and natural gas, except solar and wind in combination are certainly ascending, natural gas is declining, and between wind and solar, solar is gaining um, that right now it was about 50-50. So about half of the new was wind, half of the new was solar. And this is all utility scale. So they're not talking about residential systems at all. That's not even incorporated in the number. So um, pretty, pretty amazing, I thought. They also said that renewables are now 25% of the grid's um, generating capacity. So that's that's quite huge, actually. Um, I think about 10% of that is going to be hydro, which hasn't changed that much in the last 10 years or so. But certainly wind and solar has gone from back when I first started teaching these classes, it was usually about 3 or 4%, now up to about 15%, and uh, expected to continue to increase. So that's all good news. Okay. And um, Sorry, does that include home-based or is that still a, an industrial production yeah, that's, number only? Those are all utility scale. So okay. it does not include residential at all. In fact, it doesn't, I don't believe, include um, commercial. So, you know, the, the amount okay. might be substantially more than that. They were just talking about u utility scale systems. Utility-based. Yeah. Uh -huh. cool. Jay, Jay, I'm just curious, how much you, that do you think is driven by, and I know the economics are good, by just strictly economics and how much are driven by mandates, which are I know for a fact are driving a lot of stuff because I've got utility companies come to our company trying to get us to put up solar panels so they can take credit for uh, for whatever targets they have to have. Yeah, I, you know, I I guess I'm without doing any research. It seems to me that the the renewable portfolio standards are are not keeping up with the economics. So I would say each and each year more is driven by economics than by the original portfolio standards. Mm -hmm. um, I know, for instance, in Ohio, the portfolio standards, you know, kind of silly. It's, it's still, what, 12.5% by 2026 or 27, somewhere in there. They pushed mm -hmm. it back. Um, so I don't think that's driving a lot. I think they're just seeing that if a utility can install at a dollar a watt a solar mm -hmm. array, you know, why on earth would they build a coal power plant? You know, I mean, they're just, the economics are just so much in favor of 
of um, solar. And if there's Roughly. a wind, if there's wind available, yeah, wind is still good. But for instance, yeah. in Ohio, unless you're in the northwest corner, wind's probably not going to be a big option. Yeah, unless as long as it's incremental, because they still have to have their base load. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to they're not going <coughs> to expand those assets until yeah. they they absolutely have to. Um, mm -hmm. Or if the economics have topped, you know, have flipped so much that the cost right. of um, of buying natural gas is actually more than the cost of building a solar array. But they'd have to build in solar plus storage or wind plus storage. That's what I was going to say. Until they get batteries, this is can only be, well, it could be largely incremental. <laughs> yeah, but we have a lot of increments to go through before we reach max mm -hmm. on that. So. So I think we're living through that phase right now where it just makes sense for a utility to build wind and solar because they still have enough backup capacity with their coal and natural gas and nuclear to, to deal with the times wind is not available or solar is not available. But what, 10 years from now, five years from now, that's going to be an issue. You know, Then it's going to have to be generation yeah. plus storage has, right. to be, has to be economically advantageous over natural gas. You know, that's that's where we're moving. Mm -hmm. so, all right. Um, oh, and uh, Marcy had mentioned about solar panels in um, hurricane zones. Um, you know, I guess some of that depends on who installed it. If I installed it, I think those panels would be flying like that tin you see on the, you know, but... Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, does anybody have a, any any direct knowledge about you know the the capacity of these things to withstand? Um, they usually give you a, a wind rating, you know, when you when you buy your systems, your installation systems. But I don't think they're calibrated ever to survive a hundred and fifty mile an hour wind. Um, you know, I think they're more dealt to deal with the normal. Um, obviously, if your home gets hit by a tornado, I don't care what you installed, it's gonna it's gonna fly apart. But um, I suspect they make hurricane, you know, protected or hurricane not proof, I don't want to say the word proof, but in in those zones, you know, just like they do for construction methods with the hurricane clips and the, you know, the added reinforcement in those zones that are heavily um, uh, at risk. But looking at some of those buildings, I don't know if you guys have looked at the videos down there. I think none of those buildings that I'm watching were built to withstand hurricanes and they sit there right on the coast. You know, it's like cheap construction is cheap construction no matter where you built it, so. Um, Bill, did you have a comment there? Sure. Uh, in Houston, uh, the permit process is a, a professional engineer signing off for wind loads as well as an electrical permit. And as a PE, I've signed off on a couple of systems. And basically, the professional engineer, who presumably is a wind force expert, you know, traces the load path. Uh, I think it was 20 pounds per square foot loading based on uh, a hurricane yeah and you you trace that force that net force say three and 15 times 20 that's 300 pounds if i remember uh, per panel and you trace that load back through the the racking and and the and the lag screws that go into the roof rafters and for example uh, the pullout strength of lag screws and roof, roof rafters is, is well known depending upon the species of wood as well as the uh, as well as the embedment depth depths. Mm -hmm. So and uh, I actually did not sign off on one system because it was a panel that did not have an aluminum frame around it. So the allowable wind load uh, was less because it didn't have the additional strength of the aluminum frame. And this particular system was about forty feet in the air on the top of a pergola. And it's all clean air. Uh, there was no trees or anything, and uh, I just decided, you know, it was risky for me to uh, s state that it would stay there during a hurricane. And so far, it stayed. Of course, we haven't had any hurricanes, 
but I will drive by. And, and, and not only that, it was on a pergola, so I had to trace the uh, the forces through the the pergola structure and how it was anchored to to the deck. And so that's the process, you know. And I, I will add to that that um, that Iron Ridge, uh, uh, you know, they, they they sell racking and they uh, have uh, licensed or recruited professional engineers probably in all the states to sign out, sign off on the on a system uh -huh. you know the signature from a PE uh, one in one in Texas for example I know with their design program if you go in you tell them your zip code and then they <laughs> will they will give you the wind loading they'll give you the snow loading they'll they'll design it according to those specs but I suspect right. those do not take you know, record extreme situations. But as you were indicating, the, the wind loading also is, is not just a variation of wind speed, but it's the height of the roof off the, off the ground is an issue. The, the tributary area, you know, how, how far apart, you know, your, your spacing of your supports and also what zone on the roof is this thing located? Because if it's located near the corners, it's more vulnerable than if it's located in the center and the further back from the edges, it's safer than right at the edges because the wind tends to grip it and pull it. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into that. That's why we recommend in class using, you know, a, a design system like Iron Ridge. Um, Iron Ridge will send you the signed off, you know, uh, design specs with a PE having, you know, said at least to your inspector, this meets normal professional engineered. Um, oh, and the substrate, what you're putting it into, as you mentioned too, Bill, like whether it's white pine or cedar or, or oak or whatever your rafter is gonna be. But I ran into this down in Florida with a friend of mine after we had had a hurricane, he was replacing his roof and I was walking through and they hadn't put hurricane clips on the, on the rafters. You know, the things that anchor the rafters to the to the structure itself. And I was telling them, man, you got to get those builders to put those things in because, you know, it's there's crappy building everywhere. It doesn't matter. So um, but that will be an issue. I don't know. It just feels to me maybe this is just this this weather, but it feels like we're seeing this year some real tangible weather uh, results of global climate change. You know, I'm, uh, we're talking earlier about trees that are dying and we're seeing hurricanes and brush fires and droughts and, and maybe I'm just more aware of it or maybe it's, it's very real. It's coming at us from all directions. So. Yeah, they, they didn't used to have those fires in the old days of hurricanes. You know, no, don't no, worry I about know, it. I know, well, <laughs> it, it feels... I'm feeling it, whether it's true or not, I'm feeling it, you know? <laughs> so um, it, it feels like the world is battering us from 17 directions. So, uh, you know. I think that has nothing to do with the climate, but yes. Yeah, well, it might have to do with uh, me feeling vulnerable. Maybe, maybe it's age, who knows? <laughs> I used to be invincible, <laughs> now I'm not. <laughs> so so uh, this makes me think of something. Um, have you all uh, this talked about this group, this startup called Airthos? No, I've never heard of them. Okay, so basically their um, their pitch is that it's a lot, and, and this is just in utility scale solar context, not commercial or residential likely, um, but their pitch is that uh, it's just much better to lay the panels flat on the ground for a number of reasons. One, one potentially being the, the hurricane risk and having wind come up under or messing with the substrate or you know, anything like that. But they're claiming that you know, their model of just putting panels flat on the ground can be done in like half the time with half the cost. So you're talking about removing the trackers and racking and all of that and just putting it all on the mm -hmm. ground. Just um, just laying them on the dirt, just they, flat they, on the dirt. Do they anchor them in? I'm assuming they anchor them in somehow. 
Yeah, I mean, more or less, they're 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 anchored to the ground itself. Um, mm-hmm. Probably a series of uh, like a square series with weight underneath of them, but yeah, or or kind of like stapled on the edges and and held down. Um, but I think that that I mean, it's an interesting concept that one it might help with weather related issues in the future to have less equipment like that that could upheave the entire system but then also this cost situation of you know we want to get utility scale solar ideally even lower than a dollar per watt and you know just laying them flat on the ground more or less is maybe something to consider but i just wanted to bring that up i i found this this uh, article that was written by canary media which is basically like the the offshoot of green tech media since they're kind of falling by the wayside now and that they did a, a report or, or a look at this startup and they kind of discussed their pitch uh, of, of rethinking utility scale solar. And what's the name of the group again, Matt? It's called Erthos. Um, it's E R T H O S. Okay. Like Earth, Erthos. Uh, yeah. Earthos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll, I can, I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. I can send the article that they reference the the research on you know the utility scale solar cost drops from 2010 all the way to where we are now you know all the way up from six dollars a watt to where it is we're a dollar a watt now okay um but yeah it's interesting i mean it just made me think of since we're talking about weather risk and then also just you know general trends and utility scale solar or other solar applications it seemed like a good thing to bring up to this group. Sure. I just I just try to Google it, and I I'm not getting any hits. E R T S T H O S. Uh, yeah, T T H O S. Yeah, and if you type Canary Media with it, that's the article I'm referencing. I don't know if there's any other articles about this, but it was written uh, mid June of this year, so still pretty fresh. All I can think of is that you wouldn't want to put goats anywhere near these. So. No, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Th- this doesn't allow for uh, so many of us have goats. Still, yeah, uh, solar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, Bill, you've got a thing you wanted to show and tell here. Uh, your lithium ion battery pack that you're working on. Sure. Um, yeah. So I uh, uh, am troubleshooting two uh, battery packs. Uh, these are manufactured by Iron Edison, and uh, both of them were not showing any output voltage. Your your output. sound dropped off, Bill. Well, I don't I don't know what to do about that. Uh, where's the mic? Is it on the front of the computer? Or when you turn when you turned it up a little bit, it came better. Okay, I'll just yeah, right so, there. That's anyway, good. So I'll uh, I'll hold my computer, and this is forty eight volts, and the output uh, connections are around here and here. And this silver thing in the middle is a battery management system. Its job, it's essentially a switch. And if any bank of cells goes below 2.5 volts or when charging, uh, uh, I think more than four volts, uh, it'll cut off uh, uh, either charging or the load to protect the cells. And, uh, and Right here, you may not be able to see it. There's, I'll, I'll tilt the camera up. There's uh, 17 wires that come from 16 banks of cells to sense the cell voltage on each bank. And in this particular, actually on the other one here, uh, this one's fine, but one bank of cells in this area is showing one volt. So the battery management system uh, cuts off the load or charging capability, and it did its job. And uh, I'm gonna go about removing this bank of cells and hopefully finding some replacements. These are what's called 2665 uh, cells, 26 uh, 26, uh, millimeters diameter and 65 millimeters long. And you said these are uh, lithium, lithium ion? They're they're lithium iron phosphate. And uh, I think it was a well-designed system, but as with all batteries, uh, they they age, and uh, this this one presumably aged out. That is, we didn't have a uh, 
a fault or faulty cells. It just, you know, after however many charge cycles, it, it, it decided I'm going to go to sleep forever. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's it. Any questions or anything? These are 300 pound packs from Iron Edison, and I believe they uh, originally cost $8,000, which is crazy, but it is what it is. Uh huh. About how many kilowatt hours do they carry, Bill? Uh, um, the, uh, let me think. The cells are uh, 3.2 amp hours, uh, but I would have to do some math to uh, determine. Um, what the kilowatt hours is. Uh, What's your voltage? 48? 48 volts, 200 amps, but I don't know how long it'll go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that looks pretty cool. So you're going to try not to kill yourself with it. Right. That's right. I mean, all of us or most of us have touched uh, output from a single panel at pushing 40 volts. So I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly going to be careful. There's no question about that. <laughs> Okie doke. <laughs> All right. So uh, before I get to the thing about the end phase, did anybody else have anything they want to bring up? I, I was going to ask, did you see that, uh, not Tesla, but one of its subsidiaries has registered for providing retail power in Texas? I know we've talked about that in, in general before, but they've actually registered in Texas now. Oh, okay. I didn't see that specifically. Yeah, but I think we're going to see bust and loose uh, quite a number of, of name brands that are going to become retail electric companies. You know, we talked about in previous ones like Apple and Microsoft and even mm -hmm. Walmart, Amazon, they've all got approval from, um, from the feds. So it'll be interesting to see when they begin to, uh, to market themselves to the general public. Mm -hmm. I, I, I keep coming back to the fact that if I were a utility, I don't think I'd want to be a utility. And speaking of being a utility that I wouldn't want to be, one, one of my initial impressions when I started seeing the, the things in, in, New or in New Orleans area, the damage from the hurricane, is I was looking at that thinking, there is no way they're restoring power within a month. You know, I mean, you look at the kind of infrastructure damage that's there just that one high transmission power line that's in the middle of the mississippi river uh, they said there were about two thousand miles of utility lines down I, I mean they can't fix one mile on my road in a month i don't know how they're going to fix two thousand miles you know that quickly so it's just going to be amazing i mean it, we're going to hear about it everybody whining I'll blame Obama, you know, it's his fault. So, but um, well, let me talk a little bit about the, um, the ensemble system. And I'm going to do a little screen share here of, um, of my a, a diagram. Can you all see the, the uh, end phase ensemble uh, diagram? Yeah, so... Yeah. I, I thought I could show you some pictures of it, but it turns out they're just boxes. You know, there's, it's not going to help you out. But the concept here is with an existing microinverter system, um, now most people who are installing the microinverters are going to use the combiner box, which is here um, for, for very practical reasons. One is it gives you a nice place to uh, connect to that's outside of the building. But also um, the, the uh, communications device is incorporated in that combiner box. So when you talk about simple economics, you can get the combiner box with the communications system for about 650 bucks, or you can buy just the communication system for about $600. So why on earth would you not just buy the whole combiner? And this combiner has four double pole connection points so it'll take up to 80 amps of service. So you could bring in three, um, three branch circuits up to 20 amps each for your microinverters. And then you can add one branch circuit essentially from your battery bank that'll handle up to 20 amps. So that's really designed for three branch circuits of microinverters and one 
circuit for your battery bank. So this battery bank here is, um, it, it comes with a 3KW, it's actually like 3.3 KW, um, or you can hook three of them, up to three of them in parallel to get a 10 KW uh, backup system. They hook right in just, you know, the straight AC wiring, 240 um, single phase. And then this unit, uh, this combiner box, if you're gonna be hooking it up normally, you go to an AC disconnect and then to your uh, load panel. But if you want to incorporate the batteries, you would then wire this directly to their, uh, what they call their N power smart switch, which is basically an auto transfer switch um, that then connects to the meter. And then you connect your load panel to this smart switch. So this would be for a whole house backup system. So if you follow the wiring logic, you're going from your inverters or your panel down to your combiner box. You're hooking your um, storage system into this smart switch. So you would normally have hooked it in here if you didn't have the, the um, or I'm sorry, yeah, you would have to hook it in here. You'd, you wouldn't want to hook it in here. Um, so you'd hook it into your smart switch and then you would hook this to your, to your main load panel. So I suspect, I haven't looked at this specifically, but I don't know if it has an AC disconnect built into it. So my guess is for um, utility purposes, you probably need to put your AC disconnect somewhere up here, you know, to meet the NEC code of your shutoff. Um, if you put your AC disconnect between this and the meter, that would also, uh, no, I better give some thought because it's not gonna turn off your battery system. You'd have mm -hmm. to have a disconnect switch in here, but there is that requirement of an externally operable uh, disconnect up there within 10 feet of the meter. So there's gotta be a disconnect up here, but they haven't put it in. Jay, let me ask a question. Does the disconnect you have to put outside by the meter still have to be between the M power switch and the panel in order to cut off the power coming from the battery? Because you, when you hit it outside, you want it to cut off all the power. Yeah. You have to go in and out, in and out, don't you? Or well, you? There's, there's that confusion because the concept is when I turn it off, I want it to turn off at the, at the array. That's for the right. uh, uh, rapid shutdown requirement. Mm -hmm. But if you have a battery backup system, Mm -hmm. then that's designed to kick in as soon as it loses sight of the grid. Right. So you need a secondary um, disconnect for the battery bank system, which I suspect is built into this smart switch. Okay. Um, so the reason, the reason I, asked, I think when I did it, I ended up putting the disconnect between the smart, I didn't have a smart switch, but between the, in, the inverter and the panel, but it was outside. Yeah. Yeah, that's normally where you would put it. Um, but I know you've got a ba battery backup system as well, right? Right. So that's how, what I'm that's how I hit it. Yeah. How do you turn off your batteries then? Uh, the battery goes into the inverter. So if I have it between the inverter and the main panel outside, then it cuts off um, the yeah, power. But, the, but doesn't your battery then kick in as soon as it loses sight of the grid? The battery's kind of always on, but the, the power won't go to the to the house because I've cut off between the inverter and the uh, the panel. Where's your inverter on this diagram? Pardon? They're microinverters, so there's not an inverter. Yeah, the microinverters are up here. And actually the microinverters are down here too, because that's another feature of this system. Yeah is they have um, four, each of these battery packs has four special end phase. Um, they're not, well, they are inverters, but they're taking the DC and converting it into AC um, at that point, which is interesting. It's an interesting selling point that they have because there again is no single point of failure. They were saying that this particular system, the storage system will, um, allow 
that if one of those microinverters goes down, the other three will continue to function. So you've got essentially four of them, whereas with any other type of uh, battery backup system, there would be a single point of failure. They were also touting that this system, when it's in standalone mode, um, normally what you've got there is um, if, if the battery's full, then it's kind of like everything's on or everything's off. Either it's running from the battery or the battery is being charged. But this has enough sense to be able to turn on and off individual inverters, uh, individual microinverters on your system and run and bypass the battery during full sunshine so that your household loads would be serviced entirely from your array unless the load demand exceeds what the array is producing and then would be pulling from the batteries. So that seems to be, you know, they were touting it as a selling feature. I thought most systems did that as a matter of course that you could bypass the battery and go straight from the inverter to the loads if necessary. But sounds like it gives a little bit of added flexibility. Um, when I was looking at some pricing, uh, the smart switch I found retailing for around $1,600 to $1,700. So that's your auto transfer switch here. This combiner box is about $650. Bucks. And then I found the 3KW uh, at around $3,000. So between all of them, you're looking in the five, five and a half thousand dollar range to get a simple um, AC coupled system here um, for your already existing microinverter system. So that seems still pricey, but relatively reasonable, you know, compared to the alternatives. Um, and so what we've started doing, of course, is when we're installing these things, is putting in the combiner box and then wiring to match the full 80, 80 amps from that point to the load panel, um, which would um, be, you know, would cover in case you wanted to expand it. But I'm, I'm wondering if it doesn't make sense looking at this particular diagram, if you wouldn't want to wire it to a um, junction box of some sort located about where you would put your smart switch if you ever put one in the future and then continue your wiring into the load panel so that you basically wired it as if you're going to add this switch sometime in the future and the only added cost would be to put a junction box out there near your meter right about where you're putting your AC disconnect. Um, I guess the AC disconnect could count as your junction box. And then you could just jump from the AC disconnect to the smart switch and then continue on to your um, load panel. But it's something to consider. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the answer would be there. I want to put another diagram here. Um, this one is if you have a sub panel. And the, the other one is if you're doing the entire backup, but now what you've got is essentially feeding from the sub panel to the smart switch and then from the smart switch to the load panel. So this would be uh, an issue where if you're not wanting to back up the entire building. Because there was some discussion about one of the drawbacks of this is that the output of these, uh, if you have the 3.3 kW, it can only output 1.3 kilowatt of, of, um, of draw. If you put three of them together, it was about five kilowatts uh, in, in parallel there, which, you know, I guess to my way of thinking is, is a fair amount. But if you're running air conditioners and things like that, maybe it's not. Um, you know, if you're only running critical load, I think you could get by with it. But, and, and what I couldn't figure out from the descriptions I read is when they say 1.3 kW, 
for the battery bank, for a single battery bank, does that not include whatever the output is from your array? So, you know, is that only if you're drawing solely from your battery bank, you can draw 1.3 kilowatts? Or if the sun is shining, is that in combination with um, the array's output plus the 1.3, should you need that power draw from the battery bank? Great. Any any observations or comments from from all of this? I've got Jay. Just a general question or observation. If you're drawn directly from the array, doesn't that maybe the, the system is fast enough to switch it back and forth, but and to provide the the battery? But doesn't that kind of leave you? Um, let's say a cloud comes by, or you know whatever. Um, doesn't that leave you at kind of at the risk of a flexibility in the power? Your fluctuations up and down. Yeah. Battery that quick. Oh, I would think that it's that quick for sure. Okay. You know, these are within milliseconds. But what what I don't know would happen is let's say you do have fluctuations. You're drawing and you're somewhat near its capacity. Um, mm -hmm. and then there's a cloud cover, and now you're you're drawing more than what the system in combination could handle. Does it just trip like a trip breaker? Or do you get a brownout or, you know, what happens? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't quite know since I've never actually used one of these systems like that. What happens when you exceed the capacity draw? It's not like a breaker where you've exceed the amperage. It's just mm -hmm. that the available power isn't there. So, you know, does it prioritize loads and turn some of them off? I can't see how it would do that. So does it drop its voltage to accommodate the amps, which would then damage your equipment? Or does it just trip? You know, I, I suspect it just pops like a breaker, which would be annoying. Um, yeah. you know, and then how would you reset that? But I think that's gonna be the same in any kind of situation, you know, that you have battery backup. If your draw exceeds its capacity, something's got to happen to terminate that. So, um, your system, Don, you have the mm -hmm. Solar system, yep. right? Have mm -hmm. you have you operated it in standalone mode? Yeah, the the farm is is off the grid, so it's it's always in standalone mode. So what what happens? I um. Have you ever exceeded its draw capacity? Uh, probably not really. I mean, it's got three inverters, so we're talking thirty kilowatts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so even running the electric dryer hasn't really, you know, and the and the heat and you know the the uh, uh, no. I, I'm thinking we had. I had at one point. Um, I had brought in a. Uh, a uh, surge protector from the office, and I think it had a it had a short in it, which I would that essentially be drawing more than I mean, it's drawing all the power at once. I don't know if that would be treated the same as pulling too much, but I knew it would trip the it would trip it would trip off the inverters. Okay, they would shut down. Is that essentially the same as drawing too much? I mean, if it's a short, I think it's just taking all it can out or ground fault or something. Yeah, I don't know. It would probably treat it as a ground fault, which then the ground fault detection would would trip turn it off. And that's what it did. Yeah, and if your batteries get below their their set point, um, they're going to just turn off, and the system's going to shut off well, too. It, then the generator turns on. Yeah, well, that's another thing. And obviously, this has a place in these diagrams for a generator to be added into this yeah. system. So I guess what I was looking at is. For my purposes, I'm I'm looking that I want to expand my system so I can use my array if the grid goes down. It's mm -hmm. not so much capacity of battery storage. I don't need to worry about that. I just need to have functionality of the array during daylight hours um, mm -hmm. if the grid goes down for an extended period of time. Um, but because I can okay. modify my own behavior to, to limit usage. Yeah, but when you still need again for the the idea that you know you know right now I'm looking outside and I've got cloud cover, so all of a sudden the array went from, you know, six thousand whatever, 
uh, down to a couple to under a thousand. So if you if you did that, wouldn't you have the brownout issue or some other kind of a, if you were if you didn't have any kind of a battery or anything else supplementing it? Yeah, well, you've got to have some sort of battery just to convince or to send right. a signal to your inverter. Yeah, yeah, yes. that is still operating. Yeah, um, I, I would have to, you know, I don't know that they're going to tell me these things because part of the problem with any of these technical is that they make so many assumptions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's sort of like people assume that you have a piece of paper, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, answer these questions. And, and there's an assumption, you have a, something to write with, you have something to write on. So they assume this is so elementary that they don't need to tell us, but those of us out here yeah. who have never used it don't know what they're talking about. So yeah. ha not having lived with it or, or talked to someone who has, I don't know. Um, my concern has been one of if we had like a New Orleans situation where there's not gonna be electricity for a month or more, mm -hmm. how can I make my system function to at least keep my freezers cold and, and keep the refrigerator mm -hmm. cold? I, I don't need lights. I can deal with that kind of stuff. I can deal, so I can, I can mm -hmm. manage my load as long as I've got something there, um, you know, periodically. So, so that was where I was coming from, but we're much more survivalist mm -hmm. than, um, than a lot of folks, but. Oh, almost a prepper there, Jay. Yeah, almost, almost, <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I feel that way sometimes, <laughs> so. Um, all right, so uh, any, any other comments on, on these kind of systems? I've, I've made a couple of notes. I'm gonna look and research what happens if I overdraw on a standalone or a, a, a backup system, because uh, we've never really looked at that. Um, and then also on the flat panels, do a little bit of research. I saw Matt had posted the link on that article here if people, if people are interested. But um, um, anybody else have microinverters or intend to put them on? Marcy, uh, your systems probably, if you've got shading issues, you're probably looking at microinverters, I would assume. I believe so. Yep. I have, yeah, we are having them at the panel, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, you may want to, um, hopefully we'll, I'll do this research on just where these things are and how they work, you know, the connection points, because you may want to go ahead and wire your system, um, mm -hmm. anticipating in the future, adding a battery bank and an auto transformer, because um, you know you I'm may as well do the wiring now. I'm adding a Ford F-150 Lightning, hopefully with uh, capacity for <laughs> to uh, to draw it to the house. Yeah. But yeah, that's what I was wondering if you had an array in just as you were saying in a hurricane situation, a grid tied array. Is there a way to then get some of that power out of there just to keep essential life running? Yeah, well, so. that'll be a curiosity with something like an F-150, uh, you know, the Lightning. Um, they're already talking that the charging station would have to be bi-directional. You know, you'd have to be able to feed your home through that charging station. I mm -hmm. wonder if that same start charging station would have the communications ability to communicate to your array. And my guess is probably not. Um, you'd be able to run your house off of the load limitations of your F-150, but your array would probably still not be generating at that time mm -hmm. because it's, right. not, it's not communicating to your array that there's still power. Um, I might be wrong. It may find the signal somewhere. I was gonna say, could you, could you put the, the charger, you know, on this side of the inverter, so to speak? And then you'd have the battery there to make them think the array's on. You'd have to have a cutoff switch, obviously. They took the, the power off, you know, the, the power off to the the islanding stuff but yeah mm -hmm. yeah no i think you're right once it sees that 240 ac signal you know mm -hmm. it should sync up with it um well then you'd have to worry about what would happen if you begin to overcharge your f-150 i guess you'd have to have something that would well wouldn't that let me guess wouldn't the f-150 by itself because you plug it into a you know any place in the you know any charging station wouldn't it have to have some kind of an internal um yeah monitor to kind of say hey we got enough guys turn it off yeah that would make sense 
because it would be. Yeah, I mean the cars, the cars monitor. You yeah. Can't, they only they don't even let you charge to 100. percent They're all set to be. Just depends which brand, which model, but to like 85 yeah, percent and never it, really over 90 percent of battery capacity. So they ch they shut off. It's got to have essentially a, an internal BMS. I mean, it, or yeah. something functioning like that. But I wonder, you know, with, with solar panels, with standalone systems, if you don't need the load and you don't have a load dump, the system just doesn't generate. That's but, right. But in a uh, grid-tied system, uh, is that same capacity built into the microinverters? Because um, they're assuming the grid is connected. So has Enphase made that, that thought leap to say, mm -hmm. all right, we may be operating with no grid connected um, mm -hmm. and, and we need to not generate. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't how, know how if that's a natural thing or if it's something they'd have to program. Yeah, if, and if there's multiple, obviously there's multiple microinverters, how would they coordinate too? Well, they were saying that the microinverters within the battery will do that electronically. Question okay. is, does it need to be done electronically or would it be a natural phenomenon like gravity? You know, if, if there's nowhere for it to go, it's not gonna go. Um, but this is AC. Yeah, once it- I mean, it's, it it's going back and forth all the time. It's yeah, once it hits the inverter, but what happens from the panel to the microinverter? Oh, to the microinverter. Okay, you're saying you're saying do they have it built into the microinverter at that point? Saying we're not getting a getting a load that we stop taking power from the panels. Yeah, yeah, basically. Okay. Now we know okay. that when it loses sight of the grid, it just shuts off, and that happens. But in mm -hmm. this case, we're saying don't shut off, but don't accept power. Um, is that built into the functionality naturally or is that something they'd have to anticipate right because if it's connected the, if it's connected to the grid you always have a dump yeah yeah but if we're fooling it and it's not connected to the grid then it doesn't always have a dump right. so so are we perhaps building a a fry out situation where we're going to over generate or your refrigerator it's hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Again, that's worth checking, but I don't think I'll ever find any source to check that, you know, unless. Yeah. Could so you call the company and just ask them? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 haven't I, had, I haven't had good luck calling large businesses and asking them I, questions. <laughs> I, I call the solar people all the time, and they're the friendliest people in the world. They'll, they'll get the engineers on there and sit there and talk you through it. Aren't but they from, aren't smaller. they in Texas? They're in Texas. They Texas. Yeah, yes. Texas people are friendly, you know? Enphase is in California. I don't know how friendly. That, that, that might be a problem right there. <laughs> <laughs> Does That's the source offer of your any kind of training, Jay? Pardon? Does Enphase offer any kind of like tech training? They, you know, they have their little instructional videos. Um, but I think it's all considered just plug and play kind of stuff. Um, we're getting into some stuff here that I think is more advanced than, than what they would consider a general public training type thing. Um, I, I can check with some of the installers I know to see if they've got specific installer training on that. Um, the other thing that's worrying me a little bit is so many of these companies, they, these guys have a, what they consider a proprietary solution. You buy this, you buy that, you buy this, and they're all connected and everything works just great. What happens when we decide to introduce a Ford F-150 Lightning into the mix? You know, how accommodating are they to that? Um, do they really mm -hmm. care? You know, they want you to buy their their battery for three thousand bucks. They don't want you to buy a lightning. Yeah. So um, it's, it's like Apple versus Dawson in the nineteen nineties. Apple's yeah. really slick, but you can only do five things. Yeah. And Dawson, you can do whatever you want, but you could screw it up yourself too. Yep. Look at it. Well, that's interesting. It's something to ponder. If anybody else wants to look this stuff up or has better sources, that'll be good. I've got some homework here to do. 
All right, any other questions before we call it a day? All right, well, enjoy the good weather. I think the, at least in my neck of the woods, they're gonna draw out some of this moisture after tomorrow. So looks like we're in for some cooler, drier weather. So we can thank Mississippi and Louisiana for that. <laughs> All right. Okay, take care. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. Good to be on.